So you'll be participating in biotechnology and bioinformatics labs that'll last several weeks this semester. And of course, we'll be working with the nematode worm, Cenorhabditis elegans, which we'll be culturing on these plates. And the amazing thing really about the biotechnology revolution is that we're able to learn a lot about really tiny structures. And so we've already talked about how to use micropipettes, or if you haven't watched that video, watch that video and you'll be using them in lab. And they're critical because we're working with tiny volumes of tiny molecules. So let's think about biotechnology. In our lab, we'll be working with nematode worms that contain less than 1,000 cells in their millimeter long body. And so we're already starting with something small. Now DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, it's a large biological macromolecule. It's a polymer. But at the same time, in absolute terms, it's still really small. And so once you've extracted that tiny DNA molecule from the tiny cells of these tiny worms, we're dealing with really, really small quantities. So we're gonna need the instruments of biotechnology to be able to scale up that material to a usable quantity. So you'll be extracting DNA from worms, you'll be isolating that DNA, and in order to end up with enough material to do our labs, you're gonna to have to make many copies of the gene of interest. And so we'll be using the processes of DNA extraction and then DNA amplification using polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. So it's a little bit like if you found a really great magazine article and you wanted to share it with all your friends in class, you would go to the library, you would find the magazine and find the article, but you then just have one copy. So you take it to the photocopy machine and you make lots and lots of copies, not of the whole magazine, but just of that one article that's of interest to you. Once you've made those copies, you have enough to share with friends, you have enough to do some cut and paste, remove some pictures and use them for other things. You have enough material to do whatever you'd like. And so that's basically what our process will be like. We're gonna collect small amounts of DNA from just a few worms, and then through polymerase chain reaction, you're going to target the gene of interest, and you'll be, through repeated hot and cool cycles, you'll be making millions of copies of that gene of interest, so that when you're done, you'll have enough copies of DNA to do whatever you like with. And the thing that we'll be doing in lab is teaching you to separate DNA fragments by their length, so by their size, using gel electrophoresis. In gel electrophoresis, we run a current through the DNA and it will move slowly across the agarose gel. So the gel is gonna be of a jello-like consistency and the bigger fragments will take longer to move, the smaller fragments will move more quickly. So you'll separate by, them si by size and then we'll look at them using our gel imaging system to see if you captured your gene of interest and to look at the comparative sizes of those different genes. So the second piece to this is how do we handle these vast quantities of information? So in the DNA era, we can sequence things so quickly, we have whole genomes for a variety of organisms, but that's a lot of information. And so biologists are pairing with computer scientists to produce databases for storing the information and analysis programs to help us make sense of it. And so bioinformatics is the second portion of our biotechnology work. And I'm gonna show you a database on the computer that'll be one that you'll be exploring as part of our lab exercise. So probably one of the most important databases for you to know about is this one housed at the National Center for Biotechnology Information. If you look for this later, if you can remember NCBI, you'll be able to Google it very easily. So this is essentially the United States National Database for Biotechnology Information. And in fact, any researcher who receives public funding in the United States or if they receive U.S. money and they're working somewhere else, well, they're required to submit all of their data to this database so that it's accessible to everybody in the public. And so NCBI's biggest resource is probably GenBank, and that's probably the best well-known. So you can search through here, research the list to find GenBank, or we can open the tab I already have prepared. 
So GenBank is the database where researchers post their nucleotide sequences for DNA that they have analyzed. And the biggest resource people use, the most common search, would be to do what's called a BLAST search. So when we click on BLAST search, here's the page we get. BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. The idea is that you can enter in a nucleotide sequence that you know about and you can search the database for any sequence that is a similar match. So maybe you know the gene sequence for a particular gene in fruit fly and you want to know do zebrafish have a similar gene? Do humans have a similar gene? Do chickens have a similar gene? How about honeybees? How about sheep? So that's what the BLAST search tool does. And so the simplest form of BLAST search we could do is the nucleotide BLAST. And when we click on that, we get this search database that has a sequence query box where we just enter in our code. So normally we would be starting with some information, but for our example, I just made up a code. So you see ATT, ATT, GCC. Notice it's all A's and T's and G's and C's. So those are nucleotides. And when we've entered that in, you can see usually our sequence might be a lot longer. You'll be practicing using this database in class, but once you're sequence is entered and you've selected all the parameters as indicated by your lab instructors, then you'll click BLAST and it'll begin to search. So you can see it's searching 33 bases and then the results come up. And so here we have the BLAST results for a nucleotide sequence with 33 letters. And as we scroll down, we can see that we have some pretty decent alignments that have 40 to 50 bases that match. And so some okay matches, not really great. If we had a really close match, we would want there to be more matching parts of the sequence. So this isn't too bad. But as we scroll down, we'll notice that there's a table that shows us what those sequences are from. So in the database, what were the sequences from that happened to match the sequence that we entered? And as we look at that, we can see that most of the top hits here are gene regions in Escherichia coli. You heard of E. coli? That's actually the bacterial cell that our nematode worms eat. So as we can continue down, not only E. coli, but here's another type of coccus bacteria, Albertii. And if we wanted to learn more about those genes, we could click on any of these to get more information. And so I'll leave this for you to learn about in lab as you're searching for genes in our worms that are similar to genes in humans. So you're not going to get a complete understanding of how to use the databases or of how to perform biotechnology experiments, but you'll have a little flavor of it during our lab exercises and hopefully it'll set the foundation for your future work. If you really enjoy that portion of the work, we have a couple of advanced genetics courses that will give you more hands-on practice and I urge you to look into those after completing your first genetics course.